Good morning and welcome to uh, Sabbath School, the church at study here in Anderson, Indiana on the 5th of February, 2022. It's good to see all of you here this morning, braving the cold weather here in Indiana. And uh, we're glad that you're with us. And those of you joining online, we're glad you're with us this morning also. Hope everybody's doing well wherever you may be this morning watching our telecast and that you will have a blessed day together. Before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Father, which art in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to come together this morning. We pray now that you will guide and direct in our study. Send the Holy Spirit into our midst this morning. Speak to us through the Holy Spirit as we open up the scriptures and as we study and read together. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, as I always do, I like to share a little reading with you before we start. And today's reading comes from a book that's entitled, That I May Know Him. Jesus said, <clears throat> said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's John 14, verse 6. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he uttered a truth of wonderful significance. The transgression of man had separated earth from heaven and finite man from the infinite God. As an island is separated from a continent, so earth was cut off from heaven, and a wide channel intervened between man and God. Jesus bridged this gulf and made a way for man to come to God. He who has no spiritual light sees no way has no hope, and men have originated theories of their own regarding the way of life. But the only name given among men whereby they can be saved is Jesus. Across the gulf that sin has made come his words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Man can be justified alone through the imputation of Christ's righteousness. Man is justified freely by God's grace through faith and not by works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is the gift of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. After the enemy had betrayed Adam and Eve into sin, the connection between heaven and earth was severed. And had it not been for Christ, the way to heaven would never have been known by the fallen race. Christ is the mystic ladder, the base of which rests upon the earth and whose topmost round reaches to the throne of the infinite. The children of Adam are not left desolate and alienated from God, for through Christ's righteousness we have access unto the Father. By me, said Christ, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. That's John chapter 10, verse 9. Let earth be glad. Let the inhabitants of the world rejoice that Christ has bridged the gulf which sin had made and has bound earth and heaven together. A highway has been cast up for the ransomed of the Lord. The weary and heavy laden may come unto him and find rest to their souls. The pilgrim may journey toward the mansions that he has gone to prepare for those who love him. And that comes from the publication magazine. It's called Review and Herald, and that was written back in November the 11th, 1890. November 11th, 1890. The golf and a bridge, it was... That connection between heaven and earth was severed with Adam and Eve when they fell. And of course, Jesus, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Jesus, the faithful priest. Jesus, the faithful priest is what we're going to talk about today. And as you look at this, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews, uh, reading a lot of texts in the book of Hebrews today. But he is the faithful priest. And look at this verse here, Hebrews 7, 26. I'm on page 44 of the study this morning. 
For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. That's Hebrews 7.26. When you look at that first paragraph, if you will, follow along, it says the gulf that existed between God and us was caused by sin. The problem was compounded because sin also implied the corruption of our nature. God is holy, and sin cannot exist in his presence. So our own corrupted nature separated us from God, just as two magnets in the wrong orientation repel each other. In addition, our corrupted nature made it impossible for human beings to obey God's law. Sin also involves misunderstanding. Human beings lose, or I should say in past tense, human beings lost sight of the love and mercy of God and came to see him as wrathful and demanding. So it tells us this week we're in Hebrews chapter 5, 6, and 7, and this will provide a careful analysis of Jesus' priesthood for us. There are so many things in this lesson this week, and we have a certain way of, of studying and reading, but I wanted to go and follow up right off the bat with that text, and to do that, turn to page 49, and then we'll come back uh, to Sunday's lesson. But I wanted to make sure that this topic on Thursday's lesson, page 49, was covered. And you can turn back to where I just read from on page 44, and that is Hebrews 7.26, what it says. Now it says, what are the five characteristics of Jesus in this passage? So let's look at that and follow along, if you will, there on page 49. It says, Jesus was what? First off, Jesus is what? He's holy. That means that he was without fault in relationship to God. He was without fault in relationship to God. Now, there are some texts to back that up, and let's take a look at those texts this morning. And um, those of you that do not want to be called upon at this time, just kind of shake your head at me so that I'll know who not to uh, call upon as we read from the Bible this morning. Okay? Everybody looks good. Okay. Hebrews 2.18. Juan, if you'll start off with that. Lawrence, Hebrews 4.15, please. And uh, Kevin, Hebrews 5, 7, and 8. Hebrews 2.18. <clears throat> that, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he's able to aid those who are tempted. So, what is it talking about there? It's talking about temptation, isn't it? And what is involved with temptation? And what happens if a person is tempted and falls? Now remember, the next one, Hebrews 4, 15, please. <clears throat> For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched, with the filling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted in all points like we are, but yet was without sin. You know, we're, we're talking about holy here is what we're talking about. Kevin, the next uh, one, please. Hebrews 5, 7, and 8. In the days of the flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Learned obedience by the things which he suffered. What do you think that means? Learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Uh, 
I, I, I read that explanation on, on the lesson that said that Jesus, said how, how Jesus learned obedience, he, he, he was never disobedient. So my son have to learn obedience because he's disobedient many times. So Jesus has to learn because he never had to obey anybody because mm -hmm. he was God. Mm -hmm. So he's, he was God who, who mm -hmm. has him to obey. He, doesn't, he didn't know how to obey anybody, so he has to learn obedience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So does he have anything on us, Jesus? No. No. So what you're telling me is that we can be as obedient as Jesus? Okay. And we'll talk more about that as we go through this lesson today. Because a lot of people today... Uh, and in history, wouldn't necessarily agree with what you just gave me the answer. They would agree, they would disagree. They would agree to disagree with us. Well, let's move on here. On the same page, it says, Jesus was undefiled. He remained pure and untouched by evil, despite being tempted in all points, which we just read there from Hebrews 4.15. And it goes on to say Jesus' perfect sinlessness is important for his priesthood. The Old Covenant stipulated that sacrificial victims had to be without blemish to be acceptable to God. Jesus' perfect obedience during his earthly life made it possible for him to offer himself as an acceptable sacrifice to God. That's Hebrews 9.14. He goes on to say that Jesus was separated from sinners when he ascended to heaven. The Greek verb tense suggests that this is a present state for Jesus, which began at a specific point in time. Jesus endured hostility from sinners during his earthly life, but he was victorious and then was seated at the right hand of God. He also is separate from sinners, is that he was perfectly sinless. Perfectly sinless. When you think about that this morning, it says at the bottom of that page, on page 49, it says that he was a human being. He never sinned. And the question is, there, how do we wrap our minds around this amazing thought? Think about just how holy he must be. Why then should the promise of his holiness being, created to, uh, being credited to us by faith help us or help assure us of salvation? I'm not going to ask for an answer on that one right now because, like I said, I'm starting at the back. I'm going to go back to the front here in just a little bit. But I want you to think about that one because I'm going to come back to that in a little while. But when you think about that, his holiness being credited to us by faith that helps us assure us of salvation. Well, it goes on here and it says, Jesus was exalted above the heavens. Well, think about that one. Jesus was exalted above the heavens. It means that Jesus has been exalted above everything there is, and therefore, he is one with God. It says in the Psalms, God is the one who is exalted above the heavens. Jesus was fully human, but he was not a sinful human being, as we are as we are. Notice that it keeps going back to Hebrews 4.15 many times throughout the study this week. Well, let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 2, 14 through 16. And Phil, would you read that, please? Hebrews 2, 14, 15, and 16. And Don, if you would, 1 Peter Chapter 2, 21 to 23. 
Hebrews 2, 14, 15, and 16. Hebrews 2, starting at 14. Since God's children here on earth have bodies of flesh and blood, the Lord Jesus came and took on the same, so that by his death he could break the hold of him who has power of death over us, that is, the devil. By doing this, he freed us from a lifelong slavery to sin and from our fear of death. Clearly, he does not need to help save sinless angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Notice what he just read there at the end, that last sentence. He does not need, talking about Jesus, he does not need to save sinless angels. However, he is come to, say, descendants of Abraham. You know, when you think about this, and we've talked about this before, Jesus, and you've answered the question before that I've put forth to you, did Jesus have to come to this earth? No. No, he didn't have to come. Only because he said he would. Only because he said he would, right. Yeah. And we've talked about this before because we were, we're in a dark world. And there would have been no hope for any of us in this room this morning or anyone viewing us through the internet today. There would have been no hope. None. The Antediluvians, some of them lived, you know, hundreds of years. People today, you know, 70, 80 that would have been the end, brothers and sisters. That would have been the end. Because there would have been no hope. There would have been nothing there for any kind of a, a future. Wouldn't have happened. Kevin? Although I, I, I agree with the concept that he didn't have to, but I think when we say that we we are a little short-sighted on God's love. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that you would not do for your children? You know, I saw earlier this week, and it was an old news clip, I think, but um, these little kids were out on a pond, and they fell in. This lady didn't really even know them. She ran out there, fell in herself, but was able to save them. You know, everybody was all safe and happy, they ask her, why did you do this? And she said, well, I love them. And they said, but I didn't think you knew them that well. Well, I didn't. And I think that, that sometimes we, we short sight what love is. We have no concept what God's love is. I think to some extent, and, and we won't understand it throughout eternity, even studying God, but to some extent, I think that we short sight God when we say he didn't have to. I think he did. I think that his love is so vast and so strong that he was compelled to save us. And I know that it, it, it's things we don't really understand, but I think it's, it's worth thinking about. How mm -hmm. deep is God's love? Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Very good. How deep is God's love compared to how deep our love is? Big difference between the two. Big difference. How deep is God's love compared to how deep our love is? Let me share a couple of things here with you from the little companion book. And those of you that have the little companion book, I'm on page 45. And it says, Jesus has given to childhood and youth a perfect example. Study the pattern, Christ Jesus, and copy it if you would be like him, pure, holy, sinless, and undefiled. Study the childhood of Christ. He was the Son of God, yet the Bible record tells us he returned from Jerusalem and was subject unto his parents. 
Obedience is an element of true greatness. No one can be truly good and great who has not learned to obey with a clarity. And that word, I looked it up today, that means enthusiasm, excited to, to do it. Can you imagine that? Excited to obey. Because if we're obeying, we're bringing um, and showing, in this sense, the way this is written, for Jesus is what we're doing. Notice it goes on. Remember your characters are not finished. You are building up day by day a character. Weave all the kindness, obedience, thoughtfulness, painstaking, and love into it you can. Make it after the divine model. Educate yourselves that you may possess the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. You can make the world better by living in it if you only do the very best that you can. Only do the very best that you can. And that's from a book called Our High Calling. Let men worship and serve the Lord God and Him only. Anything that is made the subject of undue thought and admiration, absorbing the mind, is a God. Notice that's in a small g. Chosen before the Lord. Anything. Doesn't say one or two things. It says anything. Man is forbidden to give to any other object the first place in his affections or his service. Whatever we cherish that tends to lessen our love for God or to interfere with the service due Him, of that do we make a God. Do we make a God? Don, if you would, go ahead and read, please, what I ask you to read for me. That's 1 Peter chapter 2, 21 to 23. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Thank you. You know, when you think about this, he is our example. We're talking about obedience here in this and following him. And notice that because he is the holy, innocent unstained, separated from sinners. He is our Savior, and we too can reflect his character. We too can reflect his character. Now, as I started out in the reading, you know, there was a gulf created between mankind and Jesus and God when they fell in the Garden of Eden. And that gulf had to be, it was repaired and, of course, that was through Jesus. So let's go back here to page 45. A priest on behalf of human beings. And let's take a look, if you will. Turn to Hebrews chapter 5. And we have some verses there in Hebrews chapter 5. And my brother from Austria, if you would, please... Turn to chapter 5, if you would read verses 1 and 2 for me, please. And then Jennifer, if you would, 3, 4, and 5. Mike, if you would, uh, Michael here, my brother, read 6, 7, and 8. And then Juan, if you would finish up 9 and 10, please. Go ahead, brother. 5, verse 1 and 2. For every high priest... Selected from among men is appointed to officiate on their behalf in matters relating to God, that is, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with people who are ignorant and easily deceived, since he himself is subject to witness. Hmm. Did you catch that in verse 2? I mean, these are, these are all great verses, but in verse 2, he can have passion on those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is also subject to weakness. So we're talking about uh, a high priest here. Go ahead, please, Jennifer. 3, 4, and 5? Yes. 
Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So when Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him, but was appointed by who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Okay. Michael, seven and eight. Six, in seven, eight. Six, seven, eight. Yeah. As he says also in another place, you are the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Thank you. <laughs> in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with, a, with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Although he was a son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Juan, finish up, please, 9 and 10. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Called by God. When you think of this in relationship to a priest on behalf of human beings, there's a couple of things. This priest, this high priest, the position... How did it come about? By? Well, let's go back a little bit further than that. By God's choice. By God's choice. Appointed. Called. And of course, the first high priest was Aaron. Because they were called by, or he was called by God. He was appointed by God. Now, we would have the sacrificial system, which most of you are aware of, for a period of many, many years. And remember I told you that sacrifice that they would bring would be without blemish. That means it had to be, it was perfect. You couldn't take your sacrifice, if it's a lamb, let's say. There were other things that you could use, but let's say a lamb. You couldn't take that lamb that was, had a broken leg and take it down there and say, well, that's, you know, that's kind of the bottom of my uh, livestock holdings that I have. It's got a broken leg. What good is it going to do? So I'm going to take it down there and offer it up because the, the real nice ones, you know, I'm going to be able to get more money for. No, that isn't the way it was set up. And notice another word in here was obedience that we've seen come out this morning in our study. So if you brought that leg or that broken leg lamb down there, are they going to accept that, you know, as, as the priest there and, and offer it up? No, because the obedient part is you do what you're asked to do. You bring that sacrifice without blemish. And that's what they would do for a period of hundreds of years. And then, of course, the ultimate sacrifice was paid by Jesus Christ. Now, how did Jesus Christ become the high priest? Did he earn that position by coming and living a perfect life, as we've been reading this morning, that he had no sin? How did Jesus Christ become the high priest? Chosen by God, my Cho beloved son. Yeah, thank you. Chosen by God. My beloved son, as we just read. Chosen by God. It was not a situation where that it is hereditary or passed down. 
It was not a situation where, well, just because I'm your son, I'm going to be the high priest. This is important to understand the part that has just been mentioned more than once here in the last few minutes, and that is chosen by God. Nothing that he, you didn't earn it, you didn't pay for it, chosen by God. Mike? To reinforce that, what line did the priest come from? Levi. Aaron. Aaron, tribe what, of Levi. What tribe did Jesus come through? Judah. Judah. So it proves to me, at least, that he was chosen by God. Right. He didn't earn it nope. by hereditary. No, nope, he did not. He did not. You know, when you... Go ahead, Phil. Jesse, I think one of the things that we're alluding to, but we're kind of going around is, is, is Aaron was the first high priest, and he was tribe of Levi. What do we assume? We assume that the high priest came from the tribe of Levi. That was, that was the assumption, and I, I think that we're talking about that, but I think we need to recognize that when we think of high priests, we automatically think of the tribe of Levi. That was where the high priests came. Mm -hmm. And if Samuel was high priest, and who, who came in after Samuel? Wasn't it his sons? No. Who came in after Samuel? I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss, but what I'm saying is, is usually it, it was passed down through the family, mm -hmm. and it was through the, the family, the tribe of Levi, mm -hmm. and that's what we assume. But what we're recognizing here is, is, is that the true high priest is chosen by God. By God, right, right. It was nothing. You know, it even got to the point, folks, in relationship to the high priest here before Jesus came, that it was an office that, that people were killing for, that people were paying off other people to obtain. Um, it became very corrupt, a very corrupt situation, not in line with what we are talking about right now, the way that it was established. The th and when you look at this, a priest on behalf of human beings and the sacrifice that Jesus made, when you think about that, and that kind of love, which we've already talked about, that love that Jesus has compared to the kind of love that, that we have today, you know, how can it even be compared? I mean, we can't understand it, as Kevin mentioned earlier in his comments. Well, let's look at this, 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9, and Lawrence, would you read 1 Peter 2.9 for us? It says that we are a royal priesthood. What does Jesus' life tell you? That your relationship with uh, other human beings should be because we are in this sacred role. Go ahead, please. But ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Think about those words, and I hope you have that in front of you. That's uh, 1 Peter 2, 9. Think about those words that are in that text. Let me find that here, and let's really think about that this morning. 1 Peter 2.9, Lawrence just read it for us. And ask yourself, as I put some questions forth, do you think about yourself when you wake up in the morning that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, members of a holy nation, his own special people, that you can proclaim the praises of him who called you and me and others out of darkness into his marvelous light? 
a royal priesthood. We are special. And I think another word that he mentioned in his reading there, a peculiar people. You can use the word peculiar, you can say special. I guess a lot of people like to hear the word special as opposed to peculiar. But, you know, same thing here as far as special, peculiar. You're a special people, Martha. So I've been stuck on Elijah and Elisha for the last month or so. Uh huh. And so this morning I was reading in Prophets and Kings about Naaman. And so you're talking about God's people and how we're called and set apart. And so it's talking about how the little girl that lived in Naaman's home had been taken from Israel. Right. And so it says, a slave far from home, the little maid was nevertheless one of God's witnesses, unconsciously fulfilling the purpose for which God had chosen Israel as his people. As she ministered in that heathen home, her sympathies were aroused on behalf of her master. And remembering the wonderful miracles healing wrought through Elisha, she said to her mistress, and we know that she goes on to encourage her, um, to encourage him to go to him. It says, the conduct of the captive maid, the way that she bore herself in that heathen home, is a strong witness to the power of early home training. So it still goes back to how we're called and how she, even though she wasn't a priest, she wasn't in, you know, probably from the tribe of Levi or who, who knows, right? But she still unconsciously fulfilled that purpose. And it started in the home. So the parents are the ones training children to be these priests in this world. Thank you. Yes, that's a very good uh, comparison there in the relationship to, uh, as she pointed out, the little girl. Whenever I see that, I think of the Bible story books and how that little girl is portrayed, you know, in the books. And, you know, they portray her, you know, eight, nine, ten years old, something like that. And you think about the witness that, that she had in, uh, to, uh, to the people that she was working for. Um, you know, uh, many times in our lives, we are in situations that we may not think that we have a real uh, impact on anybody else. But as we've studied many times throughout our study here in this class, we are uh, impactful on every, everybody that we come in contact with. We have an impact upon them. We might think that we don't, but we do. It's either going to be a positive or it's going to be a negative. And, but in this case here with this little girl, by obeying and, and following, you know, learning her parents had taught her, she was able to be a witness. Lawrence? The last part of that verse is there's a reason why we're peculiar. Sometimes we wear that peculiarity as a badge of courage. I go to church on a different day. I eat this way. I don't do this. I don't. That doesn't mean anything if we're not using it for the right reason. And that's the, to me, that's the end of the verse. It's, it's to glorify God. If I'm not doing that, then why be peculiar? Right, yeah. Why not be part of the mainstream and just go on in life? Yeah. Yes, brother, go ahead. You know, the word uh, peculiar actually is a word that has to do with... Uh, a possession, a saved possession. It's not uh, not uh, emphasizing the the uh, any anything intrinsic in the person or in the one that is called peculiar, but rather it is that which has been saved in the in the original. And mm -hmm. so that I think that puts a little different slant on on us. In other words, when we look at at our position with God, it's because we're saved. Jesus is called the Savior, and we're the, the other part of that. You know, we're the ones that are saved. Right, right. That's, that's what we are. Right. We have been put aside and made a, made a treasure in his treasure house. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, we are uh, saved because of our belief in a Savior. That's very true. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
Let's take a look here on page 46. According to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Now, let's talk a little bit about Melchizedek. Before we do that, let's take a look at some verses here. Genesis 14, 18, 18 through 20. Now let's see. Kevin, would you read that for us? And then Phil, would you do Hebrews 7, 1, 2, and 3? Hebrews 7, 1, 2, and 3. Kevin, Genesis 14, 18 through 20. And it says, who was Melchizedek? And how did he prefigure Jesus? And, um, Pastor, we may ask you to get involved in this discussion after we do some reading here, and you can share with us your take on Melchizedek, okay? So, let's go ahead, Kevin, if you will, Genesis 14, 18 through 20. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God most high. And he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abraham, Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemy into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Gave him a tenth of everything, you know, of the spoils. He gave him a tenth of everything. Phil, Hebrews 7, 1, 2, and 3, please. In the days of Abraham, Melchizedek, king of Salem, was called by God to serve him as priest. He went out to meet Abraham when he went out to meet Abraham when Abraham returned from defeating four local kings and rescuing his nephew Lot. And when they met, Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Abraham acknowledged Melchizedek's priesthood by giving him one-tenth of everything he had brought back. So you can see how great a man Melchizedek was. His name meant king of righteousness, and because he was king of the city of Salem, his name also meant king of peace. One and two. And three. And three. From the scriptures, we know nothing about his father or mother, or his beginning, or his end. So in this sense, he's a type of Christ whose priesthood is timeless because he always was and always will be. Always was and always will be. When you look at this, it says that he was both a king and a priest. I'm on page 46. He was also superior to Abraham since Abraham paid him the tithe. And it says, likewise, Jesus is king and priest, unlike Melchizedek, but however, Jesus was sinless. So, as you look at this and read this, and Pastor, if you would address this at this point, was Melchizedek Jesus? Was Melchizedek another person? What, who was Melchizedek? Says he didn't have a father and a mother, um, as we just read. Go ahead, please. I've often wondered this. Um, as far as I know, it's just a type. Uh, Melchizedek was just a type. And what Phil was reading actually kind of shows that language. He was reading out of the clear word, which is a paraphrase that Jack, Dr. Jack Blanco did of the text, and you can see clearly the way that he interprets that scripture as it being a type of Christ and not actually Christ. So I, I haven't seen anything where it's a theophany, which is a manifestation of Christ in the Old Testament. There are other theophanies, um, but as far as I understand, Melchizedek wasn't a theophany. He's, Paul's just trying, and I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, Paul's just trying to um, bring in the idea that the Aaronic priesthood is not enough, that Jesus comes from a different priesthood, a, a different um, line to show what God is doing through him. Mm -hmm. And so he's making those comparisons and trying to 
help people understand. Because the whole idea with Hebrews is Paul is saying Jesus is better in every way. So he kind of goes down a list of things that Hebrews believe, the Hebrew Christians believed. And, um, you know, there's a better sacrifice. There's a better priesthood in this sense. And so he's saying what Paul's trying to communicate is that there's a better priesthood than the one that you've known. It's the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Jesus and he's like Christ. Melchizedek. Yeah. He comes from a different place. He's not yeah. like Aaron. Yeah. He's not the priesthood of Aaron. So I, I think that's the idea that they're trying to get across. Yeah. But don't stone me because yeah. I don't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Notice at the bottom of page 46 that question. What does the revelation about Melchizedek teach us about how God works among those who have never had human missionaries preach to them? You know, brothers and sisters, there's going to be people in the kingdom that didn't go through a revelation seminar. There's going to be people in heaven who did not have a missionary come to the boondocks of the outermost part of this world or planet. Now, I can't explain that to you. But think about that. Think about that in relationship to the goodness of God and individuals listening when prompted by the Holy Spirit in their lives to follow a greater being than themselves. That's something to think about. Also, by the way, after Pastor makes his comments, if anybody, if you remember when we started out, on the bottom of page 49, there was a question. So if you want to uh, comment on that, any time after the pastor comments will be fine. I think something that we can say is, is um, and I wish all Christians believed this, but they don't. Um, one of the things that stands out about the, a biblical religion is the idea that God is looking for an excuse to save and not to condemn. And so he's going to try to find every way he can. And, and Paul was really clear about this in Hebrews, how God has placed eternity in the heart of every person. And even those who don't know God's law have law unto themselves, the law of morality, because God has placed that in them. And, you know, some scriptures in the Old Testament where we see that people will see um, what I believe is Jesus' hands prophesied and, and ask him, what, what happened? And he says, I was wounded in the house of my friends. I mean, if somebody's asking Jesus what happened to his hands, they haven't heard the gospel. Right. And there's a couple other things. Now, there is something that we need to be clear about, that to him, the scripture to him who knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. And so we, we need to live up to the truth that we know. And uh, I think everybody here is going to be held accountable for the truth that they know because we're here, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are folks that we see in the scriptures that God is looking for a, an excuse to save. Mm -hmm. I think in all of us, God looks for an excuse to save instead of to condemn. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Keep thinking about that question there on the bottom of page 49. Um, let's take a look at page 47. An effective priest, an effective priest. Now, let's look at Hebrews 7. And Brother Whiting, would you read verse 11, 12, and 13 out of Hebrews 7? And Don, would you finish it up with 14, 15, and 16, please? And it says, why was there a need to change the law? Follow this very closely. Why was there a need to change the law? Mike? Seventh chapter of Hebrews? Yes. Verses 11, 12, and 13. And finally, if the priesthood of Levi could have achieved God's purposes, and it was the priesthood on which the law was based, 
Why did God need to send a different priest from a line of Melchizedek instead of from the line of Levi and Aaron? And when the priesthood is changed, the law must also be changed to permit it. For the one we are talking about belongs to a different tribe whose members do not serve at the altar. Verse 14 also? No. My, uh, Don will pick it up from there. Thank you. But, but again, that shows that the tri <coughs> Aaron's line were called to be the priest. Right. right. <coughs> and it says that in, in Numbers 3 as well. It's not an assumption. And then, of course, what you just read there, Mike, in uh, verse 13, it says, um, from he of these things are spoken, belongs to another tribe, another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. And Mike brought that out earlier. Don, pick it up, please, 14, 15, and 16. For it is evident that our Lord arose from <laughs> Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. Boy, think about that last text that he just read there. Who has not come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, referring to, you know, the priesthood, where it came from, but according to the power of an endless life. According to the power of an endless life. The gulf was created. And that gulf then became repaired through what? Came repaired through what? Jesus Christ. That gulf is not there anymore. It's not there. Jesus Christ filled that in. He filled that in because everyone in this room and everyone watching today on the internet has an opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus Christ and to repent and confess of our sins and he then appears as our advocate, like a lawyer. If you've ever been to court, you know lawyers. And he's also our what? He's the what? He's the priest. He's the priest for us, making atonement for us before his father. Think about that. Think about that this morning. That is available to all of us. It's not a, an, a, an exclusive club. No. Uh -uh. It's available to all. And as we mentioned earlier, talking about individuals that have never heard about Jesus but they have had inclinations through the Holy Spirit to do what's right. Some of these tribes all over the world, you know, out in the boondocks have had that opportunity to have that. Jennifer? So I've, <clears throat> I've only been to court a couple of times, but I was there one time. That was actually a joke. I've been a lot. And so this one time I was in court and I didn't know I was gonna need an attorney and I was having trouble with one of my sons getting to school on time or at all. And so I really did not know I would need an attorney. I thought I could just talk to the judge, tell him he's 17, he's bigger than me, it's hard. And I got there and he started asking me questions about my finances, about what I do for a living, about this and that, and I just, I, I was totally out of my depth and I was, before the judge alone and so I'm standing here and he's talking to me and he can tell I'm out of my depth but that's my fault I didn't bring an attorney and he let me know I should have known that so from behind me I hear a familiar voice say I got this one I'll take this case and 
I turned around and it was my attorney for another case. And so he stood up beside me, he went up to the judge, asked for a continuance, took me out of the room, and we you know, did our business out there. But what a relief I felt when I heard that familiar voice stand up behind me and say, I got, hold on, she's out of her depth, I've got this one. Mm -hmm. And that particular attorney actually went on to take that case pro bono. He didn't charge me for it. And it was kind of a big deal because I really didn't realize how much trouble my son and I had gotten ourselves in. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it shows me that when you talk about Jesus being our high priest, that we, we don't even know how out of our depth we are. We don't even know how much trouble we're in. And we come before the judge and don't think we need an advocate. We don't even know what we've done wrong entirely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it just, it, it makes me very happy to know that I have a high priest every single day going before God saying, I got this one. She doesn't even know what she needs to know. Hold on. And he takes me aside and he teaches me a little more each day. And remember also, like you refer to there, uh, hearing that voice. You heard that familiar voice behind you. And you heard that voice because you had done business with that mm -hmm. individual before. And it's the same way with Jesus. If we are studying and have a relationship with Jesus, we will hear that voice and have that peace and that comfort that you're referring Confidence to. Confidence yeah. he, that he could handle my case and handle it mm, appropriately. Yeah. But yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Mike? I'd like to read some of my favorite verses out of Hebrews okay. concerning this topic. <laughs> I've underlined them, highlighted them, I put arrows behind them. <clears throat> While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could deliver him out of death. And God heard his prayers because of his reverence for God. So even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as the perfect high priest, and he became the source of eternal salvation for all of those who obey him. And God designated him to be a high priest. <clears throat> and then back in the fourth chapter, that is why we have a great high priest who has gone to heaven. Jesus is the Son of God. Let us cling to him and never stop trusting him. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same temptations we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it. <clears throat> then over in the 8th chapter, here's the main point. Our high priest sat down in the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. There he ministers in a sacred tent, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human hands. But our high priest has been given a ministry that is far superior to the ministry of those who serve under the old laws, for he is the one who guarantees for us a better covenant with God based on better promises. Thank you. And that last uh, verse that you're guarantees, boy, isn't that, a, you know, when you think of guarantees, what comes to your mind, you know, he guarantees it, as Mike was just reading there, guarantees it. Yes, Nayeli, come on up, please. Working in the mental health field, has given me the opportunity to understand that when we make wrong decisions because our emotional state is not right, because it can be many reasons, and reading and see that God is so mer merciful and that he is my priest and he's also my, you know, the ones who when I make wrong decisions, he can make it right for me. And when I'm not okay, he say, well, you know, I got her. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we even make those decisions that the consequences are even farther what we can do. And still in that point, Jesus said, I got this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's just a big relief for me 
when, especially when I talk to my clients, and they're like, I don't know what to do and in my mind. I can't speak with them about God right. unless they bring the topic. But in my mind, I say, oh, Lord, thank you. Because I know you got this person. And I know in some point in their life, you're going to show them how much you love them and how much you can save them. And you know what? Sometimes also people make decisions that they can see after that. And even at that point, God say, I got this. Mm -hmm. And he keep advocating for us. And he keeps saying, I pay that price. And it's wonderful to see that no matter what we do, he always going to bring us back. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Very well done. Well, time has come to an end. And I uh, want to make sure that uh, you don't forget about studying this question that I put forth to you. And that was on page 49, at the bottom of that page. And I'm going to read it again. Though Jesus was a human being like us, he never sinned. How do we wrap our minds around this amazing thought? Think about just how holy he must be. Why then should the promise of his holiness being credited to us by faith help assure us of salvation? Help assure us of salvation. That is a God that we serve of deep, deep love. Very deep love. And think about that today as you go about this afternoon. Give that some thought. At this time, we have the mission story being brought to us by one, and then after that, we'll have our video. Thank you all. Morning. Uh, our study today come from the uh, Asia, the Southern Asia Pacific Division, <clears throat> and today. Our, the title of the story is Beating Stratton Fate. It comes from the country of Timor-Leste in, uh, in that region. My younger sister called me excitedly one day. Sister, she said, I'm studying the Bible and the lessons are very good. Come and we can study together with the missionaries. Hearing that enthusiasm in my sister's voice, my curiosity was aroused. And I met with her and Mary, and a married couple, Juliana and Luis, who were Bible workers. Please teach me about the Bible, I asked them. I was studying at a university in Dili, the capital of Timor Lester. My sister, Amalinda, was studying in high school in the same city. We both, we both came from a small rural village. I studied the Bible with the couple almost every day. The Bible lessons fascinated me. I learned about God's great love for me. I learned that one way, that one way that I could show my love to God was by honoring him with my body, including, my, including by eating clean food. I learned that a big way to love God was keeping his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments in John 14, 15. I was especially, especially interested in reading the Ten Commandments. I had never heard the Four Commandments which begins, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, Exodus 28. When I realized that God had never changed his holy day to Sunday, I asked the couple where I could worship on the seventh day Sabbath. 
I want to keep the Sabbath day, but where can I go to church? I said. We have a church in Dili, Louis said. You can go to there every Sabbath, Juliana said. And Melinda and I went to church together. After attending church for two weeks, we decided to baptize and join the Seventh-day Adventist church. Our older brothers <clears throat> were furious when they found out that I had left our family church. They threatened me and beat me. You will not study here anymore, one brother said. We will bring you back home to the village, said another. My brothers forced me to leave my studies and return with them to the village. They made me eat pork and go to church with them on Sunday. I felt so sad. I had to lock myself in the bedroom to read the Bible and pray. But the threat and beatings strengthened my faith. I resolved to love God with all my heart and keep his commandment. The threat and beatings went on for months. My younger sister, fortunately, was able to stay in the capital. She called to tell me that the Adventist Church was organizing a two-month training program for Bible workers. I wanted to be a Bible worker more than anything. I wanted to be like Juliana and Luis and Luis, who had told me about the Bible. I wanted to teach others about God. One day, I ran away from home without telling anyone. After two months of training, I became a Bible worker. I loved my work. I threw myself into it. I prayed daily for my family and especially my brothers. Two years passed and I married my husband, Reynaldo, who is an Adventist, who is an Adventist. No one from my family attended the wedding. Thanks to, uh, thanks be to God, my family has started talking to me again. I am also grateful to God for three children who are now studying at the only Adventist school in Timor-Leste. Please pray for my brothers and the rest of my family. Please pray that the school will be able to teach many children about Jesus and his word. Your 13th Sabbath school six years ago helped open the seven-day Adventist school in Timor-Leste. Part of this quarter offering will help construct a dormitory at the school so that the children from faraway villages like Lesitas can study at the school. Thank you for planning a good and generous offering. God has given each of us a way to serve and show his love to the world. It can be difficult to find a career that pairs our God-given talents and interests with ministry. For students interested in adventure and service, Union College's International Rescue and Relief Program, or IRR, tries to do just that. The program focuses on teaching rescue skills and community development practices around the world. Every student spends their last semester in the field, using their skills in the real world. We're here in Palmer, Alaska, staying at the Adventist Church's campgrounds, um, part of a semester of excursion and adventure in Alaska. IRR gives you a lot of cool skills ranging from anywhere from EMT skills to swift water rescue to building uh, sustainable projects in developing countries. One of the skills they are training for in Alaska is avalanche search and rescue. They've gone out to train every day this week and during snow and freezing temperatures. Many of the IRR students see benefits well beyond the physical training. So all those skills are unique and different, but they have one unifying purpose, and that is to relieve the suffering of humanity. I view that as what Jesus did as well, was living his life to better the lives and to save the lives, ultimately, of the people around him. Um, and IRR enables us to do the same on a lower scale, um, and to live out our lives the way that Jesus lived out his. These students had an opportunity to practice this type of service 
when they were called to respond to a storm that had destroyed communities in the state of Iowa. Just days after the disaster, the team of students and staff were ready to go. For our Iowa trip, I was warned on Saturday that this could be a thing, and then Sunday morning we were prepping and packing to leave. And so with that, I think it's really cool just to live like the disciples. They worked with Jesus, and they were always constantly ready to leave. I really aspire to be that type of missionary, that type of a uh, Jesus lover that is able just to go on the fly without any warning. Um, and I think the IR program has really equipped me for that to the point where I'm confident wherever I go and whatever I do, I know that I can make an impact. While on earth, Jesus was more than just a teacher, preacher, and healer. He was also a first responder. His ministry was to rescue and relieve the emotional, physical, and spiritual suffering of those around him. Union College's International Rescue and Relief Program has taught these students how to use their passion for adventure to tell others about Jesus. I think IRR is a great way to have what we call a uh, career of adventure and a lifetime of service to where we can serve the people around us and help them have a better life so that they can see that we care about them as Jesus cared about them and then we can share our message with them and it means a lot more. There are many ways that God can use us to show His love to the world. The IRR program is just one example. You can visit AdventistMission.org to see how people around the world are combining their talents with ministry. How will you use your unique gifts and talents to show God's love? Good to see all of you here this morning and those of you joining us.